One of the biggest series to launch in recent memory has to be Stranger Things, of course. And one of the most iconic things about Stranger Things is its music by Kyle Dixon and Michael Stein. And I'm really excited to have them today on Composer Talks with White Bear PR. Welcome, guys. Hello. Hey, Chandler. Hey. Nice to be here. <laughs> so Kyle Dixon, Michael Stein, Emmy-winning, two-time Grammy-nominated musicians. Uh, they crashed into the composing world with their dreamy throwback score to Stranger Things. And in addition, they've been nominated for an ASCAP Composer's Choice Award and a World Soundtrack Academy Award for uh, TV Composer of the Year, or Composers of the Year in their case. And in addition, they've also scored for projects such as Native Son on HBO and Valley of the Boom on National Geographic. But last um, December, you were nominated for TV Composers of the Year at the inaugural Society of Composers and Lyricists Awards for your music on Stranger Things season three. So what was that like to kind of celebrate and kind of be in that first time um, award show with your peers? Oh, it was really fun. It was, a, it was a really cool evening. I liked what they did. It was cool to see everyone in the same room. Um, nice conversations. Uh, it was an honor to be there, I guess. Yeah, I agree. It was an honor to be there. It was nice to definitely felt like part of uh, a certain community, composer community, um, as well as some of the industry. It was nice to catch up with some people that I usually don't get to see unless I'm at an event um, and met some new, some new people too. It's nice. Cool. Awesome. Now, what has been the biggest surprise for you as musicians since the launch, uh, the launch of uh, Stranger Things? Has anything really changed in your life? <laughs> um yeah a couple of things but it, this show seems to keep getting more popular I, I feel like so it's kind of surprising that it could get more popular than it was but uh that that seems to be always surprising to me I have windows yeah. in my studio now. There, there's upgrades. I don't go crazy. Well, and Michael, you're obviously, you had a big change. You moved from Texas to Los Angeles. So that has yeah. been a big, big shift from the launch of the series. How do you like Los Angeles? It's good. I'm kind of a homebody, so not completely different, but I'm liking where I'm living. Yeah, I like my neighborhood. Excellent. Now, I felt the season one of Stranger Things, of course, was super strong. Season two for me was a bit of a sophomore slump, but season three came back like better than ever. And so I was just curious, um, do you, how have you evolved with the series? Do you feel like your music has evolved uh, along with the show? Yeah, I think that it's given us a chance to explore a lot of um, caveats of composing and go into different territory and just kind of keep learning and testing what we can do. And the show kind of takes us uh, along to explore a lot of different territory, maybe stuff that we wouldn't um, go nece necessarily go towards on our own. Kyle, how, what's changed for you over the past three seasons? Well, obviously the stories are evolving, you know, the, if, if you, even if you just look at the, the kids, like, they're literally twice as big as they were in the first series or the first season. So a lot of the music that you write for, you know, a 10 year old is not going to be the same that you write for a 14 year old or whatever. So just through following the story, the music has had to change. And also the stakes are a bit higher in each season because of all the past events and how that's affected everyone and just the scale of, like the cover up even so that's and especially in season three like everything got bigger and like as it got lighter in some areas it also got really a lot darker in other areas like the monster is considered it's a pretty gross looking thing but then there's also like pretty funny stuff and very like cutesy little stuff especially like with erica and the scoops troop and all that um <laughs> But but then on the like on the and then it cuts the screen and it's like this flesh monster dripping all over the floor, you know. So it's it's ramped up in both areas. So I I think that's definitely affected what we've what we've written. 
Yeah, I feel that the the show has, as I said, has really uh, kind of come back and has evolved. Um, now, and the score, of course, is I find much more. There's like I feel more music in season three and kind of larger, and like I said, the stakes are higher, so the drama is really ramped up. Is that a request from the Duffer Brothers, or are you guys challenging yourself to create even more amped up music? I think a little bit of both. Yeah. Kind of comes in an inherent uh, requirement when to match what's going on, and since the production's amped up, we kind of have to meet it. And yeah, there is, there's definitely from uh, director's standpoint needing certain things from us. And do you feel pressure, um, like like the expectation of delivering outstanding music because the show has such a high expectation. Obviously people are really anticipating season four. Um, do you guys personally feel that pressure as well? I don't, I don't really try to focus on that kind of thing. The only pressure you feel is like the deadline and you're not, mm. you don't really have time to like really a second guess or overthink if you're self and the music you're creating is is there at that time i guess yeah uh, if it works for for the directors and it worked for you that's all you really need to know and everybody <laughs> can figure it out you know well that's that's good that's obviously great kind of mental health tips because obviously if you think too much about if the expectations of the audience if i was worrying about what everyone was going to think of this season I would just be paralyzed with it. I wouldn't get anything done. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah that's, if, I, that's, if I literally sat there and thought, I was like, how many people are going to see this? You know, and then like, oh, that would just, no, no way. Nothing would happen. Except I would like hide in the closet or something. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, what were you like saying? a lot of music though. It definitely becomes this big machine and you're just a part of like, yeah. turning out a lot of music every day, just like sketches or, Bro, it's trying to, you're really just, it's like a puzzle and you're trying to like fill it in, you know? Like yeah, absolutely. Music in every spot there needs to be, whether it's like an idea or a finished idea. And then you just build it up and layer it up until you've achieved an episode and then you move on. It's pretty wild. Well, I would love to dive into some specifics on, on um, your soundtrack that came out in season three. And I'll start with, of course, the Starcourt Mall theme, which is one of my favorites, as you guys know, I've expressed that a lot. <laughs> and I, uh, I just wanted to know because it feels like it's lifted directly out of an infomercial. It feels so perfect for what it is. Um, can you talk a little bit about the creation of that tune? Sure. Um, I guess we had some we had some conceptual ideas behind it, um, and like what style of music we wanted to to use, um, but we, we definitely had to go outside of the typical score a little bit and do something that was a little more structured. It's, it's not, it's potentially one of the most just arranged straightforward like songs, I think that we've put out. And that was pretty influenced by, um, they initially had some big cues. I think they had Susudio by Phil Collins in the mall scene. Um, which had a lot more arrangement in it than typical score. Yeah, um, I mean, it's a pop song, essentially. Pop, it's, yeah, had, pop song. You basically had to write a big pop song for for a mall. You know, that's the, that's the character, is the mall. And what says that better than pop music, you know? <laughs> totally, yeah. And since we were dealing with the 80s, you know, we there's this idea of, you know, uh, retro synth stuff, and, and it's kind of become a, a certain thing that's, maybe not it's like over overly simplified as to what the 80s sounded like um when and so a lot of the things that we liked about the 80s are, are some of the covers of like two op songs or old 60s um style music so that's kind of once we just realized that that was a direction we could go in we were both pretty into that bought into that concept um, and so that's kind of where that came from because it does have sort of a sock cop kind of like yeah and it's just on face it's face level just like fun you know it's like the mall 
<laughs> it <laughs> is. No, big, it is. <laughs> active, lots going on, and yeah. fun. So it's just it's a song for them all. No, it's it's perfect. Another one of the tracks that really stood out to me is the Silver Cat Feeds. And I don't know, but I tweeted at you guys the other day because I really want you to create an extended theme of the Silver Cat Feeds. So I'm going to ask you that now live on this interview. Please do it. <laughs> but talk a little bit about that track and, <laughs> and um, how you came up with it. Obviously, it's a very pivotal moment because um, that I'm, I'm forgetting the, the Scoops girl name, but she you know uncovers the secret code oh. and then this music hits and I'm like this is so cool so talk about that that track a little bit please Robin what's her name Robin yeah that was a weird one I it's actually it was from season one, one or at least the the was it did it actually make it into the season I don't remember no no it was an outtake. So. <laughs> yeah it was an outtake of season one that just happened to kind of hit on all these moments. Like as she's looking around, you know, there's the kind of like chord stabs that line up pretty well with that. And that was sort of just an accident. And then we build, built it up and added more um, layers of percussion and things like that. Yes. Just, just to just to keep the intensity rising as she's as she's figuring it out. Yeah, fundamentally it was a outtake from one of the action cues towards the end of season one. Um, which another action cue ended up being in there, but yeah, it's got the it's like got the cool action vibe, and then it's you know hits those mystery kind of accenting moments in the um, in Silver Cat Feeds, which was a lot of the top top lines we put on it, just to like really sell the narrative of like all the icons, not icons, mm -hmm. but like the hat, the shirt, the decoding the message. Yeah, absolutely. No, I felt like I was in all of a sudden like a retro James Bond film where I was like, this is happening. She's figuring it out. <laughs> um, but yeah, so please, uh, extended theme on that, please. Um, the other track that I really want to dive into is Mirkwood. Can you talk a little bit about Mirkwood? Mirkwood. That's kind of like a metal song. Like, yeah. Sort of like a slow, sludgy metal thing. Uh, what so that that was like that was to end an episode I feel yeah, like yeah it was like credit of four I think yeah what happened something pretty intense had just happened and they wanted to kind of like have this like sort of dark and kind of I guess doomy sort of way to set up the next episode what was that I think is maybe Billy had just drag the maybe drag the body to the warehouse or the warehouse and maybe he actually fed it to maybe that was the first time that you i don't remember exactly but, but it's okay uh, <laughs> but the music you know besides the story what's happening in the show the music it's like it, yeah it's a completely different world star court mall obviously super pop you know mall theme and then silver cat feeds i find is completely different from mirkwood and just like i love the range that's going on in the show mirkwood kind of became part of Billy's character, um, mm -hmm. that theme. And it was used when he breaks out of the sauna. Um, it, it came in and out a little bit, but it, I guess it showed his rage. Yeah. A little bit. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, now you guys are obviously known primarily for your synthesizer work. Is there any acoustic instruments that you're just dying to write for? I wanna work with everything. Uh, yeah, woodwinds. Yeah, a little experiment with some clarinet stuff. Um, I really love French horns. I've always loved French horns, bassoons, that kind of stuff. So, I think we we would really just like to, and human voice also. I think is something that we're very yeah, human with. voice. Just trying to to write with that. I mean, we can we do we've done a fair amount of like choral stuff using synthesizers and samples and stuff but and I think we would probably try to blend it a little bit because we I think we would kind of do that anyway just naturally of course um but it's definitely something that we we are exploring now and looking for the right opportunity to explore further yeah pretty much the whole gamut all the I'll work with 
want to write for everything at some point. Slide whistle. I know. Slide whistle. Slide whistle. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Washboard. Kitchen, kitchen appliances. Yeah. Those um, I, I know one of the ideas that is being tossed around inside Netflix, which I think would be so cool, is a uh, LA Philharmonic um, performance of the Stranger Things music at Walt Disney Concert Hall. And I just think that would be such a unique experience to listen to You're still all the music about that. that you, yeah, I think that'd be amazing to do. I it's hope still they, on the uh, maybe pile. Oh, can you, if you talk to him, maybe just like blow it onto the yes pile? Yes. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. I, I mean, have you guys ever thought about arranging orchestral versions of your electronic scores? We've so, worked like very minimally with an arranger, um, and we did do a show with the quartet. Yeah, we were supposed to have a concert or in Krakow for the film festival this year where they were gonna do an arrangement of a handful of cues and we were pretty excited about that, but it's not gonna it's not gonna end up happening this time, maybe maybe next year. Um, and yeah, we we did a very fun performance um, at, in DC uh with uh, the spectral quartet spectral quartet who did um a tribute to johan johansson and we kind of applied some effects uh, while they were playing and sort of played along and then did a a cover basically of, of a song of his from mandy after they had done their pieces which was really really fun to do and they're great to work with um, yeah and they did a live string arrangement with uh, our performance of that song, which was really cool. Would love to get a studio recording of some of the techniques and things we were doing in that live show with another. That was at the Kennedy Center, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. which is crazy. Uh, you guys, yeah, you guys have performed as Survive and as Stranger Things live show, you know, pretty extensively around the world. Is there a country or a concert venue that is kind of on your wish list that you would love to perform at? I'm sure there is. I'm, um, just, I'm not sure if I know. We're it. doing a live at Pompeii DVD. That's funny. Pompeii was, I was going to make that joke too. Um, I guess that means it's true. Um, I have seen some really cool spaces on like Atlas Obscura's Instagram. That'd be cool to have a show. I don't know. These are, these aren't, these are kind of serious, but not fully serious. Uh, real venues. Um, well, I mean, it, it can be Pompeii. I mean, that's a venue. It's a, a venue. place. That, Someone was telling me about this arts foundation that had access to like uh, a, not a spillway, but like what would you call a aqueduct under Houston downtown? Mm. Or oh, 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 yeah. If someone actually makes that happen, I'd love to play in that. That place looks insane. Yeah, it's like it's just like brutalism. Oh, like the, it's yeah, inverted brutalism because it's like it's crazy well it cool. a, a show at the stalactite organ oh the yeah in north carolina i believe there's like it's the, oh the world's largest instrument and it's basically a keyboard that's hooked up to a bunch of little um solenoid like solenoid little tap motors that mm -hmm. tap the different stalactites to make different notes and it's like two miles long wow really want to play that we we uh, we asked about it and they they didn't say no, but they have some guidelines and restrictions on that. We'll see. That would be a fun venue. Yeah. But it's also kind of hard. I don't know where anyone. Would stay. I guess people would just be in there. I don't know. We'll figure yeah, it out. Yeah. To record it, record <laughs> it, and stream it. You know, let let a virtual audience watch you too. Yeah. Now, um, you guys are working on a new Survive album I heard about. Is, is there anything you can talk about or mention about the new album? Feeling it's, good about it. It's coming along. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, like most of the way there and then it's the last, whatever, 10, 15, 20% that always kind of can drag out a little bit. If If it's up to you, if you're working on deadlines, then you just have to do it and, and go along. But when you're working for yourself, you can take that time 
for better or worse. But anyway, it's going well. I, it's just, it's an evolution of the sound, I think, that we yeah. kind of all wanted to do to, to just not do the same thing over and over again, but I still think it definitely sounds like us. Yeah, at any on any of our records, we usually we get to this point where we know we're close. We put all the songs on a timeline, and we make sure they'll fit on two sides of a vinyl. And usually, we go in with like twelve songs, realize two of them aren't cohesive on the album, and then realize that we have to cut two more to actually make them fit. So, I think we're gonna have eight or nine songs um, that we've picked out, and we like the flow of the record. Just like Kyle said, it's that last 15% that we need to finish. But I think I think we can say that we are excited about it and we like Definitely. It. And I there's cool. some surprise I think there's some surprises. Awesome. Well I look forward to hearing it whenever it comes out. Um I hope you guys can see it to the finish line soon because I know people are dying for kind of new music from you guys and, and you know, maybe Maybe we'll hear it by the end of the year. Yes. <laughs> Maybe. We'll hear, anyway, you'll hear a single at least by the end of the year. We got to get good. something out. I um, can't wait. I can't wait. Well, thank you so much for, for taking the time, guys, to speak with me on uh, Composer Talks with White Bear PR. Uh, if you guys, ha if you watching have not seen Stranger Things yet, what are you waiting for? It's on Netflix, seasons one through three. Do not sleep on season three. It is really good, I promise you. Um, again, Kyle and Michael, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, of course. Thanks for, thanks for having us.